The Word of God is alive and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a critic of thoughts and intents of the heart. All Scripture is God-breathed and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be mature, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Open the word of truth this evening to Galatians chapter 5, where we continue our study in verse 14. Galatians chapter 5, verse 14. Every believer is a priest, and every believer priest has the privilege of personally and privately preparing himself for the study of the Word of God. Using 1 John 1, 9, confession of sin if necessary, bringing every thought into captivity of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Once again, Heavenly Father, it is our privilege and honor to open the infallible and errant Word and ask that God the Holy Spirit, who is the author of the Word, uh, teach us as we study it to glorify our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Well, we completed looking at verse 13 and uh, the subsequent study of the doctrine of sin last time. Verse 13 in the corrected, expanded doctrinal translation says, in order to clarify further, you, my brethren, were once and for all called to freedom. Only this freedom is not to be a springboard for the old sin nature, but through unconditional love be constantly serving one another. Verse 14 continues in the expanded, or in the New International Version. The entire law is summed up in a single command. Love your neighbor as yourself. This will be contrasted with verse 15, that which is going on currently in the Galatian churches, where he says, If you keep on biting and devouring each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. So you have two sides of the coin now. Your freedom can be uh, limited by love or your freedom can allow you to do the things which are uh, under uh, caused by the control of the old sin nature. Now, having spent all of his efforts to this point in attempting to dissuade the Galatians from coming under the bondage of legalism, he's now going to lead them through this uh, portion of Scripture uh, to uh, allow this freedom to actually be limited by a fantastic principle, and that principle is the principle of love. Now, we could study the doctrine of love at this point, but we'll wait until we get down to verse 22 uh, under the fruit of the Spirit uh, because it was taught so recently on the Thursday night class. Note that in Romans chapter 8, verse 4, we have uh, the Apostle Paul speaking of the fact that the righteousness of the law is fulfilled in the believer by the person of God the Holy Spirit, where it says in Romans 8, 4, in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the sinful nature, but according to the Spirit. Dr. Wiest explains how this works in an extended paragraph. He says, Paul's statement becomes intelligible and consistent when we recognize the following three points. First, that believers, through their relation to the Lord Jesus, are released from the whole law as statutes and from the obligation to obey its statutes. Second, that all which God's law as an expression of His will requires is included in the principle of love. And thirdly, when the believer acts on the principle of love, he is fulfilling his actions toward God, his fellow man, and toward himself. 
all that the Mosaic law would require of him in his position in life were the law in force. Thus, Wiest continues, the individual is released from one law consisting of a set of ethical principles to which was attached blessing for obedience and punishment in the case of disobedience, a law that gave him neither the desire nor the power to obey its commands, and is brought under another law, the law of love, which is not a set of written commandments, but an ethical and spiritual dynamic produced in the heart of the yielded believer by the Holy Spirit, who gives him both the desire and the power to live a life in which the dominating principle is love, God's love, which exercises a stronger and stricter control over the heart and is far more efficient at putting out sin in the life than the legalizers think the thunders of Sinai were. And that's that's really succinctly summarizes the fact that God's love produces provides the Holy Spirit and it will do what the law could never do. Actually, our Lord summarized the entire law in His day when he, in Mark, there are several places, but I've selected Mark 30 and 31 from the New International Version, where the Lord says this, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. To this, the teacher of the law, who had asked him the question about which was the greatest commandments, responds and he says this, Well said, teacher, the man replied, You are right in saying that God is one and there is no other but Him. To love Him with all your heart, with all your understanding, and with all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself is more important than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. Here is a man who was not far from the kingdom of God. And who knows, we we aren't told whether he believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, but his question answered by the Lord seems to have convinced him that he, uh, the Lord, was who he said he was. Paul also developed the principle in Romans chapter 13, verses 8 to 10, where he says, Let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. For he who loves his fellow men has fulfilled the law. The commandments, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not covet, and whatever other commandment there may be are summed up in this one rule. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to its neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. So Paul makes it very clear in, uh, in Romans uh, 13, exactly what he says earlier in Galatians chapter 5. The goal of the law was simply to produce holiness of life. That's why there was such a thing as the law. However, the problem was the law was powerless to produce that kind of a life. However, what the law was powerless to do, God, in the person of the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, is actually done by means of sharing His omnipotence indwelling and subsequently controlling the church-age believer and producing the holiness or the character of Jesus Christ in the believer. Now, the New International says... In verse 14, the entire law is summed up. The word summed up is an old friend of ours. It looks like this in the Greek. P-L-E-R-O-O, pleiro'o. And pleiro'o has actually four meanings. First of all, it means uh, to fill up a deficiency. I often have said to my sweetheart, she is my pleiro'o. She fills the deficiency that are in my life. I think that uh, the principle that God has as far as uh, the perfect man, perfect woman principle, which is taught in Genesis that when God made a, a help meet for Adam, he made 
an Eitzer Kenegadah in the Hebrew. And that means uh, not a help meet at all, but it means a, a counterpart which perfectly fits the part. And here's, here is the man and here is the woman. All have deficiencies. But when they are brought together under the perfect man for the perfect woman, the deficiencies are filled up and each one is completed. And so uh, the Holy Spirit fills the deficiency, uh, many of the deficiencies in the life of the believer from his personality to his activities and actions. Secondly, it means to fully possess. To possess is to control. And therefore, uh, the Holy Spirit is, is to control the believer. I like the illustration which I have often used with young people. Uh, and uh, it can change with the season, but uh, currently we are watching the uh, basketball semifinals, professional basketball semifinals. Now, uh, when I was in high school, I played uh, on an intramural team with four other fellas, and every team in the, ba in, the, in the class wanted to play us because we were so terrible, and they were assured of a victory. We just were the worst. Uh, uh, we called ourselves the unpracticed five, uh, and uh, it was easy for, uh, for them to beat us. Uh, they loved to play. Um, they never gave the ball to Paulie because Paulie couldn't hit the side of of the basketball backboard with the, with the, the um, uh, with the ball. But if it were possible for Michael Jordan to possess me, to control me, there would be an entirely different way that I would play basketball. I guarantee it. Even at my weight, I would play better <laughs> than. Anybody ordinary, and that's exactly what God the Holy Spirit does. God, the, I mean, I would, I might think that this is a perfect shot. Michael Jordan controlling me would say, "No, this is not right." I would say, "No, no, I'm not going to shoot." He would say, "This is the time to shoot." And controlling me, he would shoot and put the ball in. When uh, Dan was at home, we put a basketball net in. I shouldn't say I. I sort of supervised. Uh, Jan and Dan dug the hole, poured the concrete. I held the po pole, didn't I? Didn't I hold the pole for you? <laughs> but anyway, uh, and when David came to visit one time, he lowered the basketball net from 10 feet to 8 feet, and they were out there dunking like crazy, like they were, like they were Michael Jordan. <laughs> but it was really cute to see uh, them feel so great. But it was a lot easier with the basketball net lowered uh, to three to ten, uh, eight feet. But anyway, to fully possess or fully control uh, means, and then uh, thirdly, to fully influence. The Holy Spirit totally, completely influences us when He fills us. F uh, fourthly, to fill with a certain quality. The quality, of course, is the character of Christ that he fills us with. And then finally, to fully perform. There are five, I said four, to fully perform. Now, using it here to uh, talk about the whole law is summed up or is completed or is filled, uh, we are saying that the, uh, the, the, the entire law as Dr. Donald Campbell of, from Dallas Seminary translates it, the carrying out of the law. Lenski translates the fact that pleuro here is the perfect passive indicative. Uh, he says the, uh, uh, the whole law stands as having been fulfilled. Dr. Wiest paraphrases it, the whole law stands fully obeyed. And then he adds these words. The, the idea is not that the whole law is embraced in or summed up in the act of loving one another or loving one's neighbor, but that in doing that, one is complying with the whole law and the demand. So the deficiency of the law, what the law could not do in that it was weak, the, the deficiency of the law is made up in the... Uh, the new life, uh, the life of the Spirit. 
which is actually the subject beginning in verse 16, where Paul says, So I say, live by the Spirit. And in verse 22, the fruit of the Spirit is, and so forth. So the best translation of verse 14, the expanded corrected doctrinal translation, for the complete law's deficiency has been filled in the past with the result that it stands permanently filled up in the word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Putting it together with verse 13, in order to clarify further, you, my brethren, are once and for all called to freedom. Only this freedom is not to be a springboard for the old sin nature, but through unconditional love, be constantly serving one another. This is how it's seen, verse 14. For the complete law's deficiency has been filled in the past with the result that it stands permanently filled up in the word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I'd like to uh, quote a beautiful illustration here from Dr. the late Dr. M. R. D. Hahn. He says this, Yes, love is the fulfilling of the law, but it is also much more, for it goes way beyond the demands of the law. If a man keeps the law of the land, he fulfills his duty, and he needs to do no more. But if he loves his country, he'll do more than just abide by its laws. He will seek to promote its welfare, support worthy civic projects, exercise his liberty to vote, and support local government in every way. He will take part in social, civil, and civic and benevolent projects. The law does not compel him to do these things. It merely demands obedience only to the laws on the books. But love, love of country, goes way beyond the demands of the law. Love does not ask how little can I do and still get by, but how much more can I do? When I was practicing medicine, Dr. Dehan continues, we had servants in our home to do some of the work. We had a maid for the housework, and I had a chauffeur to drive the car for me. They were servants. They worked for wages. Their duties were clearly defined, and they knew just exactly how much was expected of them. They were to work certain hours, do certain duties, and for this they were to receive stipulated wages. The rules and regulations were plain. For instance, the maid, as long as she met her obligations, she received so much per week. We could expect no more from her. She had fulfilled her legal obligation, and we had no further claim on her. Now compare such an arrangement with the service of another person in our home, my wife. She is not a servant. She does not work for wages. We have no arrangement concerning hours or pay. Her duties are not outlined and spelled out for her. She knows nothing of a time clock. Eight o'clock starting time and five o'clock quitting time mean nothing to her. She never thinks about wages, never goes on strike, but gives her unceasing willing service to the home and family 24 hours a day for 52 weeks in the year. She is under no law or rules or stipulations, nor is there any need for them. I have never told her to do a thing, for she knows what her family needs and fulfills it before anyone needs to ask. No need to tell her to dress the children, feed the baby, humor the old man, wash the beds, wash the dishes or make the beds. There is no grumbling or complaining. She gets wearied and tired, but love keeps her going. Mrs. DeHaan doesn't know what the term overtime means. She doesn't ask for double time pay for working on Saturday or Sunday. And why not? You know the answer. It is love which motivates her service. She delights to give herself to her family because she loves them. And because of her unstinting loving devotion, there is no place for laws, rules, regulations, or commandments in our home. It is a labor of love. The service of love goes way beyond the demands of the law. And that's what Paul is getting to here. The law, even if it could produce a righteousness would be such an inferior, inferior righteousness to what God the Holy Spirit produces in the life that there is no comparison. But the alternative which is given to us in the uh, 
in, the, in the passage uh, will be brought out in more detail in verse 16. Let me give it to you in advance from the New International. So I say, live by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. Now, verse 15 is going to bring out the opposite of love, which is hatred. Legalism breeds division and dissension. What was apparently happening among the Galatian churches should have clearly evidenced the fact that they had left grace far behind because legalism was producing what verse 15 says. And how do we know? From the Greek text it tells us. It's not found in the uh, original, uh, in the New International, but the original actually begins with the adversative conjunction de, D-E, and, it, uh, and 15 says in the New International, if you keep on biting and devouring each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. The, the de says but, which says that instead of uh, having this love for one another, but that's not what's happening. The next thing we have is the first class condition of, uh, of if, which is the particle A plus the indicative mood in the Greek, which is a full, fulfilled, or a true condition. So Paul is saying here that if and it's true, but if you keep on biting and devouring each other, and that's exactly what you're doing. That's what the first class condition uh, of uh, uh, the Greek word tells us. Now, we have two present active indicatives, which tells us that this thing is going on at this time. The present active indicative of two different words. And they are correctly translated, so we don't have to worry much about it. The biting and devouring. But we do need to know that they are doing that right now. In classical Greek, these both words were used together in connection with wild animals in a deadly struggle. Now, while neither the passage nor the context reveals the nature of what was going on in the church, as we says, the words constitute a strong expression of partisan hatred resulting in actions that lead to mutual injury. We may get some idea from verses 19 to 21 where we read some of the activity of the old sin nature where, where he says the acts of the old sin nature are obvious and just picking out some of the words which he uses there, there are more than these but these are the words he uses maybe it tells what's going on hatred, discord jealousy, fits of rage selfish ambition dissensions and factions who are they biting and devouring? We have this Greek word, A-L-L-O-S, which is the word for another of the same kind. So it refers to fellow believers, members of the royal family. They were attacking one another. They were attacking fellow believers. The biting and devouring resulted in destruction. Now this is an aorist, passive, Subjunctive goes with the uh, the uh, uh, conditional clause. The aorist tense simply points out to an occurrence in time, and uh, the uh, uh, passive voice indicates that the subject receives destruction as a result of the former action, the biting and devouring. So, not content with simply wounding some other member of the royal family. It continues and continues and continues until the only result is total devastation and destruction. And what Paul says in this verse is that neither side wins. What a contrast. In verse 14, believers are to love one another. In verse 15, they are destroying one another. Is it possible? <laughs> oh, yes, absolutely. Absolutely. The present active indicative from this Greek word tells us that we, they must always be on the alert. B-L-E-P-O. 
the word from which we get the word bleep on the uh, uh, radar screen. It means that they are, and it's a present active imperative, imperative being a command, present tense, means keep on. So he is saying this, keep on constantly being on the alert for this possibility. Probably the irony of the whole situation is that the legalists are proud of the taboos that they practice. They don't engage in smoking and drinking and alcohol, gambling, sexual sins and the like. They keep away from those things and they're very proud of it, but they think absolutely nothing of mental attitude sins, of suspicion, of judging, of being critical of other people, of, uh, of, of uh, gossip, uh, slander, vilification, especially of those with whom they disagree theologically. And beloved, you have never been bitten and devoured until you've been chewed up by some fellow believer who is a member of the royal family of God. According to the Detroit Free Press, a patient at Mount Carmel Mercy Hospital on Detroit's northwest side was shot and killed as he lay in his bed recovering from a gunshot wound. A hospital spokesman said that the victim had been listed in fair condition prior to the shooting and was looking forward to going home. Hospital patients and employees were stunned. The spokesman said this, nothing like this had ever happened in the 50 years of the hospital's existence. Someone killed outright in a hospital. The church is supposed to be a hospital. It's not a showcase for perfect people. It's a hospital for suffering saints. And the, uh, to expect fellow members of the royal family to be perfect is an absolutely unfair expectation. It is an unrealistic uh, expectation. Would that we could say of the church that in 50 years of meeting together for fellowship, there wasn't a single instance of a wounded member being cut down by the unkindness of another member of the royal family. Unfortunately, that is not true. And there is, and having been now in the ministry for nearly half a century, I can tell you that there is nothing worse than being the object of the congregation's vituperations as being the pastor or the pastor's family. It's the pastor's responsibility to keep those things from the family if it is at all possible. But uh, early in my ministry, I determined that I would never again live in a parsonage because the parsonage belongs to every woman in the church. And unless the pastor's wife keeps the parsonage like they do, they feel it's absolutely right and proper to rip her apart and to, to rip her to shreds. And so I determined from that time I would take a, a, a housing allowance. It would be my house and nobody's business how that house was kept. And uh, uh, this is also true of the pastor's kids. Uh, my kids were all exemplary at all times. Absolutely. But I know some pastors who kid, whose kids weren't. And, of course, the problem is that the pastor's perfect kids have to get along, are influenced by the imperfect kids of the deacons. And so that's what really the problem is all about. But um, there's no one who can please all the people all the time. Uh, and as a result, it's very often open season on the pastor. We used to say that they went home and had roast pastor for lunch. To, for dinner, to take him over the coals. And uh, criticism of... Uh, and, and this has placed some fantastic pressure on some pastor's kids who were not able to be shielded from these things as they became the objects of much criticism in the church. And I know of some pastors have had to move frequently because of this kind of criticism. But it isn't just, it isn't just that within the local church. 
it's, a, it's actual criticism of the way we, uh, we look at things. In the February 1996 issue of Reader's Digest, there's an interesting article about what the author calls the most unsavory reputations in the animal kingdom. Wonder if you know what animal we're talking about. I'll see if you can guess it as I read along. Describing this animal, he says, it looks like pieces of other creatures all stitched together. The front legs and sharp clawed paws are similar to a dog's. The ears remind me of a bat's, pink and almost hairless. The whiskers are long and luxuriant like a cat's. As I return its gaze, the animal opens prominent jaws to reveal wicked, curving canines. Then it makes a low, throaty growl. I pull back as a strong stench wafts over me. He is describing the Tasmanian devil, the world's largest meat-eating marsupial found only in Tasmania, an island 150 miles south of the Australian mainland. It's where that shooting took place in the news recently when all those were killed. The description is relevant as an illustration on our subject when he says this. A champion eater, the Tasmanian devil, punctuates bloody squabbles over its daily feed of carrion and prey with the piercing screams and howls that gave it its satanic name. Given half a chance, the creature will even eat others of its kind and its own youngs. Too many Christians are like Tasmanian devils. The Arminians can't stand the Calvinists. The Calvinists can't stand the uh, Arminians. And it used to bother me frequently in some of the pastors' conferences of the ICE movement in which there was a great deal of superior-sounding criticism of the fundies. Fundies referring to other fundamentalist Christians who may have been legalistic and uh, very, uh, v- very out of line. But you see... It, it doesn't give us the right to be critical of them because of that fact. And yet we, uh, and I brought it up at one of the pastor's conferences, not the big ones where we were at Baraka or the colonel was with us, but uh, at other uh, pastor's conferences when, during our times together because I felt that it was, uh, I mean, like it or not, uh, we are members of the same body and we're going to spend eternity together. And it is true that love covers a multitude of sins. You don't have to agree or accept. You don't even have to have fellowship. Unconditional love doesn't say you have to have fellowship with these people. But you do have to uh, express your love by not being biting and devouring and tearing apart. And I don't know how many times uh, an erring brother has been won over by a critical, biting, devouring spirit. The problem with the Galatians is the same that the problem is today, and that is, obviously, those who are doing this are not living the superhuman life by means of God's supernatural power, the Holy Spirit. They're living under the control of their old sin nature, and because the trend of their old sin nature may be toward asceticism. They will not do the big five, but they will engage in the mental attitude sins and the sins of the tongue, which are involved in being critical of fellow members of the royal family. And so what are they doing? They are actually imitating unbelievers who have a similar trend in their old sin nature. And the solution is, is given in the beginning of the next verse. So we look at verse 13 through 15 in the expanded corrected doctrinal translation. In order to clarify further, you, my brethren, were once and for all called to freedom. Only this freedom is not to be a springboard for the old sin nature, but through unconditional love be constantly serving one another. For the complete law's deficiency has been filled in the past with the result that it stands permanently filled in the word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you keep on biting and devouring each other, and that's exactly what you're doing, 
constantly be alert lest you receive destruction by one another. Verse 16 then continues, So I say, live by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. Again, we begin with the adversative conjunction, meaning but, and uh, this serves to be in contrast to this biting and devouring which was now going on. Then we have the present active indicative from Lego. L-E-G-O. Lego is used of logical expression. It may be translated, I order you, command you, I recommend. In the present tense, it is continuous action, and so he, should, he is saying this, but I keep on commanding you. And then the next word is translated in two different ways. It is translated here, live by the Spirit, which is a good translation. It is translated in the King James Version, walk in the Spirit. And this is what it looks like in the Greek. Peripateo uh, is going to take our attention now, and we're going to look at it in more detail, as we look at the doctrine of walking. The doctrine of walking. Point one is the concept. The concept of walking. Walking in the New Testament can be categorized in two or classified in two different ways. Physical walking, in which one uh, uses the legs and physical energy, and spiritual walking or spiritual advance which is the believer executing the plan of God in spiritual energy. We aren't concerned at all with the former, the physical walking. The Lord Jesus walked by the sea or did that. We are concerned, however, with the second. And that it, it makes the fact that walking becomes an analogy. Just like physical walking, it implies moving forward or advancing. It also uh, implies uh, that uh, you are uh, doing it in an orderly fashion, placing one foot in front of another. It also requires energy. In this case, it requires spiritual energy to move forward to walk. Divine energy. And the divine energy which is ours is the omnipotence of God. In the function of uh, uh, spiritual uh, advance or the analogy, uh, the physical act of walking reminds us that the believer is advancing in his spiritual life or as the New International translates it, live. It really means to order order your life. In this case, it's a present tense. Keep on ordering your life. Then we have N. There is no preposition in the actual Greek of uh, verse 16. Uh, we have the dative of Numa, which looks like this. P N E U M A. It is the dative of instrumentality, so Numa is the word for spirit, breath, wind. It really refers to that which is uh, invisible but powerful. Just as wind can be, or breath can be, or the spirit. But you see, when it's talking here about instrumentality, it is saying, order your life or walk by means of the Spirit rather than walk in the sphere of the Spirit. Dative of instrumentality, walk by means 
of the Spirit. This is also used, point two, to describe walking in the light. The passage where this is discussed, of course, is found in several places. Uh, first of all, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 8, where Paul says, You were once in darkness, spiritual death, but now you are light in the Lord. Begin walking as children of light. All right, you were lost, now you're saved. And then the command is, begin ordering your behavior as children of light. Ephesians 5, verse 8. And this is nothing more than a command to experiential sanctification. Walking in the darkness is incompatible with walking in the light. It's incompatible with walking in the plan of God. So, walking in darkness is what, what you do when you are unsaved and when you are controlled by your old sin nature. When you are controlled by God the Holy Spirit, you are walking or ordering your behavior in the sphere of the light. It's used specifically for the believer's execution of God's will, plan, and purpose for the church age believer. It's the Christian way of life. 1 John chapter 2, verse 6. The person who, ab who says he abides in him, Jesus Christ, he himself ought to keep walking in the same manner as he walked. This takes us back to the precedence for the Christian way of life, which is the, the uh, humanity of our Lord Jesus Christ in hypostatic union when He was here on the earth. Our Lord's life on this earth was lived in the power of God the Holy Spirit. We are to live our lives with the same power throughout our Christian lives, which power He turned over to us when He left Acts chapter 1, verse 8. First uh, John chapter one, verses uh, verse five and six, which is very very important, uh, very clear to us. Uh, he tells us this. Uh, this is the message, John writing that we have heard from him and declare to you, God is light; in him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness. That's the power of the old sin nature. We lie. We don't, you can't have fellowship with Him. You could be born again, but you don't have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness. So he says, uh, if we claim to have fellowship with Him, yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live by the truth. But if we walk in the light, as He is in the light, we do have fellowship with one another the blood of Jesus, His Son, purifies us from all sin. You see, that will take care of the biting and devouring, won't it? We'll have fellowship. Koinonia is the word that talks about things which are common, fellowship, uh, together. And then, of course, we have uh, the final uh, is uh, found in Galatians 5, 16, where he says, walk by means of the Spirit. This is the command to remain in fellowship with God the Holy Spirit and execute the plan of God. It also uh, it describes the purpose of living to glorify God, walking in the light, according to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 12, where he says, So that you may walk in a manner worthy of God who elected you into His kingdom and glory. A general reference to the plan of God. If we're going to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord after we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, then we must be controlled by God the Holy Spirit and expose ourselves to the teaching of His Word that we may know the mind of Christ. If we do this, we will fulfill 1 John 1, 7, and that is, the, if we keep walking in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with each other and the blood of Jesus, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. So walking in the light means using the problem-solving device of confession of sin. The challenge is also found in Romans chapter 6, verse 4. Therefore, we have been buried with Him through baptism of the Holy Spirit 
in order that as Christ has been raised from the dead, we too might walk in newness of life. Walking in newness of life means walking in the light of the Word of God because we are in union with our Lord Jesus Christ, which is what is meant by the baptism of the Spirit. We'll talk more about that under the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. Walking in newness of life means the use of all of the assets that God has provided for us, the use of the invisible divine power that God makes available, the indwelling of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, and all of the things that God makes available to us by grace so that we can live the superhuman life. The faith rest technique is also mandated as walking. Colossians 2, verse 6. As you have received Christ, Jesus, to yourselves, so keep walking by means of Him. We receive Christ by means of faith, so now we walk by faith, not by sight. The term walking is used to describe the problem-solving devices in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. Become imitators of your God as His beloved posterity and begin walking in the sphere of love. Learning and using the problem-solving devices moves you along in executing the plan of God. Ephesians 4 verses 1 and 2. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, continue to encourage you to walk, or order your life, in a manner worthy of your station in life. Royal family of God. See how biting and devouring one another is just inconsistent with our posterity? Into which you have been called with all humility and true sensitivity with perseverance, tolerate one another by means of unconditional love. Walking is used for the perception of doctrine in 3 John, verse 4. I am very pleased because I discovered that some of your children keep walking by means of doctrine even as we have received a mandate from the Father. Ephesians 5, 15. Therefore be careful how you walk, not as unwise but as wise, and wisdom comes from doctrine. 2 Corinthians 5, Verse 7, we walk by means of doctrine, not by means of what we see. There are also several negative walking passages which tell us how not to walk. Psychological living in Satan's system is called walking in Philippians chapter 3, verses 18 and 19. For many believers keep walking concerning whom I have often told you, even weeping, that they are enemies of the cross of Christ, whose termination is destruction, the sin unto death, whose God is their emotions, whose fame comes by means of dishonor, who keep on thinking earthly things. The same idea is true in 1 John 1, 6. If we contend that we have fellowship with Him and keep walking in in darkness we lie and do not live the truth. 1 Corinthians 3.3 3. For you are still carnal since there is jealousy and strife and you keep walking according to men. Walking is used in a warning against the cosmic system and John 8.12 is a prophecy of this. When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. In John chapter 11, verses 9 and 10, walking in the cosmic or world system is called walking in darkness. Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours of daylight? A man who walks by day will not stumble, for he sees by this world's light. It is when he walks by night that he stumbles, for he has 
no light. And Ephesians 4.17 produces the analogy. So I tell you this, and insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. And so those who walk in the night are walking as the Gentiles, the unbeliever, in the futility of their thinking. And then Ephesians 2.10, walking is the related to the execution of the plan of God. For we are His creation, having been created in Christ Jesus for good of intrinsic value achievements, which God has prepared in advance that we should be walking by means of them. The good of intrinsic value achievements is the execution of the plan of God, the believer moving on to becoming an invisible hero. Colossians chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. For this reason we also, from the day we heard, do not stop praying for you. In fact, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge, doctrine of His will, in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you may walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, for the purpose of pleasing Him in all things, bearing fruit in every good of intrinsic value achievement. In fact, constantly growing spiritually by means of doctrine from God. Walking is used as a mandate to advance to spiritual maturity in 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 1. Finally then, brethren, we request and exhort you in the Lord Jesus that as you have received instruction from us as how you ought to walk and please God, just as you are actually walking, that you may advance still more to the objective. And so the use of divine power produces the walking in all of the categories that are commanded by the Word of God for the believer to function in a spiritual advance throughout all of his life. Now let's look at some of the uh, New Testament words for walking. I've already put in peripateo on the board. Uh, it is used in many, many places. Uh, it is used, uh, as I have said, in uh, many places, and the, 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 the verses are in your notes. It's in, um, the second word is stoikeo. It looks like this. S-T-O-I-C-H-E-O. Stoikeo. It means to march in step, to march in rank, to walk in agreement with, to function in a system, to follow a leader. It's used in the New Testament primarily for functioning in a system of ad and advancing in that system to spiritual maturity. It is used for living under the omnipotence of God in Galatians 5.25. It is used for the pattern of salvation by faith Romans 4.12. It is used for following the rules of the new spiritual species in Galatians 6.16 and Philippians 3.16. Another Greek word is poruomai, which looks like this. P-O-R-E-U-O-M-A-I. Poruomai means to go, to proceed, to travel, to conduct oneself in a certain manner, to live, to walk. It is used for national degeneration in Acts 14.16. It's used for the carnal life pattern of the unbeliever in 1 Peter 4.3, Jude verses 16 and 18, 2 Peter 2.10 and 3.8. It is also used on the other side for occupation with the person of Christ by believers in Acts 9.31. The fourth word is anastrepho. looks like this. A-N-A-S-T-R-E-P-H-O. Anastrepho originally meant in the Attic Greek to upset, overrun, or to associate. Its figurative meaning was to behave or to function in terms of human conduct. It's also used for practice of principles. It is used for the conduct of the unbeliever in Ephesians 2.3 for the motivation for the Christian uh, in, Ephesians, in Hebrews 4. Pardon me, Hebrews 13, 18, an operation of the old sin nature in Ephesians 4, 2, and it is used for life and conduct in the Spirit in 2 Peter 3, 
11. The final Greek word is orthopedeo, and you recognize immediately O-R-T-H-O P-O-D-E-O Ortho means straight. Podeo refers to the foot. means to walk straight. It's used for legalistic living and resultant hypocrisy in Galatians 2.14. In other words, they were not walking straight when they were involved in the hypocrisy of legalism. Well, we'll conclude this with a couple of points uh, next time, it isn't much uh, farther along that we are, but we have about, about three more points in this doctrine, then we will move on uh, in our study. But uh, uh, I'm not uh, much of a walker. I, I, I never have enjoyed walking. Uh, Jan walks her two miles around the subdivision here uh, every so often, uh, and as well as doing her exercises in the pool and sometimes her video exercises, but uh, apparently walking is good for you. It's done her a lot of good. She, she's done so well in her walking, and I'm, I admire her for her great ability to walk. Um, it's, a, it's a pain for me to walk. I, I, every time I walk, I may get out of bed in the morning feeling great. After I've walked a little bit, my hip is so bad that it, it's, it's like a toothache, so I don't walk any more than I absolutely have to. But uh, I do know that as far as spiritual walking is concerned, all of us have the responsibility to be walking or ordering our lives under the control of God the Holy Spirit in the sphere of the light of Bible doctrine. And while physical walking requires a, a great deal of energy, spiritual, require, spiritual walking doesn't require any energy on our part at all. It's provided totally and completely by God for us. So no one has an excuse. I've got a pain in the hip. My feet are bad. I can't walk. We all can walk by means of the Spirit of God. Now thank you, Heavenly Father, for that which we have studied this evening. May God the Holy Spirit make these things a source of challenge and blessing to us, I ask in Jesus' name. Amen.